Daniel chapter 7, uh, by a general consensus of opinion, is one of the most baffling and complex passages in the Old Testament. And uh, I am sometimes think while reading through the various uh, commentaries that it would take a legion of angels to sort out the multitude of interpretations that have been placed on this uh, chapter. There's an old Latin proverb which runs, Quot homines tot sententiae, which means there are as many opinions as there are men. And so it is with Daniel chapter 7. It's very unfortunate that many Christians allow themselves to become separated from their fellow Christians on the grounds of prophetic passages such as these. It is possible for a Christian to become distracted by prophetic scriptures. And it's even possible for a Christian to take his understanding of prophecy and make it into an idol. I can recall the look of astonishment that came across a fisherman's face along the Murray coast when I told him that I do not believe in two second comings of Christ, a coming for his own and a coming with his own. Nor do I believe in two gospels, a gospel of grace for the Gentiles and a gospel of the kingdom for the Jews. Nor do I believe in two resurrections, the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust, separated by a period of 1,000 years. Nor do I believe in two kingdoms, a kingdom of heaven, which is different from a kingdom of God. Nor do I believe in a literal millennium, a literal 1,000 years reign of Christ on earth. And um, the look of astonishment on the fisherman's face uh, was due to the fact that he took it for granted that all Christians accepted that understanding of biblical prophecy. Uh, in fact, he almost uh, made it a canon of orthodoxy. If you believed this, you were right, and if you didn't believe this, then you were suspect. Well, Christians ought not to idolize their own theologies or their own ideas of prophecy. Christians do differ on things that are not essential. And when Christians differ on things that are not essential, then they should differ in love. And so I had to differ with my fisherman friend in love. Turning to chapter 7 of Daniel, it's important to see where this chapter stands in the book of Daniel as a whole. If you soar up and take a bird's eye view of the book of Daniel, you'll see that the book of Daniel is divided into two parts. The first six chapters are history, and they tell the story of the Babylonian exile of the people of God. And because these first six chapters are history, they can be verified from the history books. These things really happened in time. There was a man called Daniel. There was a Babylonian captivity of the people of God. There were three Hebrew teenagers called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was a burning fiery furnace. These things are a matter of history. But when you move into chapter 7 of Daniel and go through to the end of the book, you find yourself in a very different world. These chapters are prophecy. And in these chapters, the second half of Daniel, uh, we see visions, apocalyptic visions, uh, filled with fantastic sights and strange and dreadful beasts. 
And amongst the visions, we see a disturbed Daniel being visited by angels and getting messages from the very throne of God. Not much wonder he complained about having splitting headaches. If you look at chapter 7, verse 1, you'll see that he is writing, he's receiving this vision, in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. If you look over to chapter 8 and verse 1, you'll see that the next vision is received in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. But of course, we have already read about the fall of Belshazzar's kingdom in the first six chapters. Now, do you see what's happening? Belshazzar's feast, the story of Belshazzar's feast, is in the first six chapters of Daniel. But now at chapter 7 and chapter 8, he starts receiving visions in the reign of Belshazzar. And what has happened is this. We've gone back in history, but in prophecy, we've gone forward in time. Now let me say that again. We've gone back in history, but we've gone forward in time, in prophecy. We're back in the reign of Belshazzar, but the visions that he's receiving are carrying us right down through time, through the Persian Empire, past Philip of Macedon and Alexander the Great, past the Greek Empire, Aristophanes, Sophocles, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, past them all, down to the Caesars and the birth of Christ, past the Roman Empire, right down past the medieval church, past the Reformation, right down to the resurrection of the dead and the second coming of Jesus Christ and the last judgment. You read about that in chapter 12. The resurrection of the just and of the unjust. Daniel is living in Belshazzar's day, but he's looking down the vista of time towards the end of the age. And that, of course, makes these chapters prophecy. If, uh, if you like, you can think of the book of Daniel as a kind of drama. And it's taking place on two stages. And in the first six chapters... You see the stage of history in front of your eyes, the church of God in an alien world, a world that is hostile to the gospel and to the testimony of Christians. And in this, in, on this stage, there is a visible con conflict between the people of God and the people of the world. There is tribulation. There are lion's dens and burning fiery furnaces galore for all who want to follow the Lamb. But from chapter 7 to the end, you're lifted behind that stage to behind the scenes, to the real area of conflict. Not the conflict between the church and the world, but the conflict between Satan and Christ, Antichrist against Christ, uh, what Paul calls spiritual darkness in the heavenly places, spiritual armies, armies against armies, war in the heavenlies, is how John describes it in the book of Revelation in chapter 12. A stage behind a stage, the news behind the news, the battle behind the battle. First six chapters, stage one. Chapter seven onwards, stage two. The spiritual warfare, the spiritual interpretation of what goes on in history. It's uh, interesting that there is um, a certain parallel here uh, between Daniel and uh, John, the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, later on in Daniel, we find Daniel being called um, a man greatly beloved. And in the New Testament, the Apostle John is called the disciple whom Jesus loved, who leaned on, on Jesus' bosom. Two men greatly beloved. Um, 
in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, Babylon was a prison. He was um, surrounded by a hostile people and alien gods that were an insult and affront to, to the majesty of the true and the living God. Daniel was isolated in Babylon. And in the book of Revelation, John is isolated on Patmos. Because what Babylon was to Daniel, the man greatly beloved, Patmos was to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was banished there by the emperor, and he was surrounded by rocks and wild seas and cut off from his fellow Christians. So there's a parallel. And it's also instructive that um, the pattern of things that holds true for Daniel it also holds true for the book of Revelation. In the first 11 chapters of Revelation, we see the church in a hostile world. This world, the stage down here. But from chapter 12 of Revelation onwards, we're lifted up into a spiritual dimension and given a spiritual interpretation of history in this world. And it's from chapter 12 of Revelation onwards that uh, we see the beasts and uh, the monsters rising out of the sea of mankind. We see the harlot bride of uh, Satan, the, the prostitute bride of Satan, who is, of course, a rival to the bride of Christ. Uh, we see the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation, and so on and so forth. It's the same story. It's the war behind the war. It's the news behind the news. It's the stage behind the stage, the spiritual understanding of what is happening to Christians down here below. And so it is in the book of Daniel. First six chapters are about history, suffering, persecution. From chapter 7 onwards to the end, we find an interpretation of this in spiritual terms. Now, there are various ways in which um, one can approach um, apocalyptic, as this is called. Um, one way is to pick out the minutiae, that's to say, pick out the small things, um, find out their symbolic meaning, and then apply them to the kingdoms of men. Um, I suppose you may have noticed that um, when men set up empires, they very often use animals as um, the symbol of empire. Um, the eagle seems to have been very popular. The Romans had the eagle. The legions carried the eagle. Uh, Aquila. The German Empire under the Kaisers had an eagle. The Habsburgs of Austria had an eagle. The Tsars of Russia had a double eagle. The Assyrians had golden bulls. The Babylonians had bulls. The British had a lion. Although its teeth have been drawn, its coat's a bit mangy too, isn't it? Don't you think the British lion is gone? Poor soul. The United States has an eagle. Now, the interesting thing is that the animals that men choose for their empires are nearly all beasts of prey. Eagles, lions, leopards, and so on, they're all beasts of prey. They're all uh, cruel animals. They are all flesh-eating animals. And so you can go through this um, vision of the four beasts and uh, pick out the qualities possessed by the animals there, and you can apply them to worldly empire. If, for example, you look at uh, chapter 7 and verse 4, you get a lion there, king of the beasts, with eagle's wings, that means it was able to rise above the earth and survey everything. It can see all that was going on. It was all powerful. It could see into all the corners of the empire what everyone was doing. 
And then later on in verse 4, the, the lion is raised up on its two feet, so it becomes a human lion, um, a beast like a man, and he's given a man's mind. So what you have, the first vision, the first empire, is, um, is a ravenous empire, and it has a human mind behind it. It's, it's Babylon, as we'll see later on. If you look into a chapter, uh, uh, verse 5, I beg your pardon, verse 5, there's the bear, which is famed for its cruelty, tears everything to pieces with its claws and can crush you, so on. There's the cruelty of the bear, and uh, it's eating... It's just finished eating an animal, and it has three ribs in its mouth, and it still needs to go on eating. It's ravenous for food. It'll devour everything, and that's the mark of the second empire. If you look further on into verse uh, 6, you'll see a leopard, which is famed for its swiftness and its cunning. It also has four wings which means it can rise above the earth and see everything that's going on. It can soar and see everything. And it has four heads, intelligence. It can see everything that's going on. It's a cunning animal. And then lastly, in um, verse 7, you have the unnatural beast with the the iron teeth, uh, an unnatural monster that tears up all the other monsters and smashes them all to pieces. An empire that destroys all the empires that uh, existed uh, before it. Now, that's one way of approaching these visions. But I think there's a better way than that. And it's to take chapter 7 and set it alongside chapter 2 of Daniel. And there's obviously a very clear connection between chapter 2 and chapter 7. Now, do you remember that chapter 2 was a vision of the image that was made of um, different kinds of metal? The the head uh, of the image in chapter 2 and verse uh, 31. The head of the image, chapter 2 and verse 32. The head of this image was of fine gold, its breast and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. An image made up of four parts, head of gold, uh, the breast and arms made of silver, the thighs uh, made of copper and bronze, and the legs and the feet made of iron and clay. And that image finishes in ten toes. <laughs> Later on, he speaks about the ten toes of the image. And then just as it stands there, there's the climax of the whole vision. A great stone falls out of heaven. A stone that has not been cut by human hands. And it smashes the image on its feet of clay. And all the image falls down. The gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron all fall down into the dust. And then the stone that comes from heaven grows and becomes a kingdom. Now, we're not left to speculate as to what this stands for. The head of gold is the empire of Babylon, which gives way to the breast and the arms of silver. That's the empire of Persia which gives way to the thighs of bronze, which is the empire of Greece, which gives way to the legs and the feet of iron and clay, which is the Roman Empire, and the ten toes are the kingdoms inside the Roman Empire. The stone that falls from heaven is Jesus Christ, He smashes the empire, it has feet of clay, all the empires come down, and his kingdom grows into an everlasting kingdom. Now, that's the message of chapter 2. Now, there's obviously a parallel between that and chapter 7. 
Because just as there were four parts to the image, there are now four beasts. First of all, there's the lion with wings. That's obviously Babylon. Well, if the lion with wings is Babylon, the next one, the bear, on our side with the three ribs in our mouth, is Persia. Because Persia was made up of three empires, three kingdoms, where were knocked together. One of them was the Medes, and the other one was the Persians, and there was a third one. And the three ribs inside the bear's mouth are the three kingdoms that Persia swallowed up in order to become an empire. And she was avaricious, you see, for power and land. Persia was one of the greatest empires the world has seen. Now, if the bear is Persia, the leopard, with the wings, the elegance, the speed, the foreheads, the intelligence, is Greece. Intellectual, you see. All the, all the philosophers, mathematics, wisdom, the wisdom of Greece. And the last one, the fourth one, the great and terrible unnatural beast with the iron teeth, is the Roman Empire. The ten horns are the kingdoms of the Roman Empire. The little horn is the Antichrist. There are many, there are many Antichrists, but the little horn is the Antichrist who destroys the people of God. And the climax to that chapter, chapter 7, is the Son of Man coming, just as the stone comes from heaven and shatters the empires, the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days, receives a kingdom, gives the kingdom to the saints of God, and the saints of God shall reign forever and ever. And if that is a legitimate way of understanding these visions, I think there's a great message of hope and encouragement for the Christian church. I wonder if I could speak about three words of hope for Christians from the heart of this chapter. In verses 2 and 3, um, Daniel says that um, he saw the winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, And four beasts came out of the sea. Now, the sea in Scripture is symbolic of fallen humanity, fallen man, fallen mankind, adrift from God, laden with guilt and sin. That's the sea. You remember that in the book of Revelation, John stands by the seashore and he sees beasts coming out of the abyss of the sea. Monsters coming out of demonized and guilt-ridden mankind. In fact, Daniel says later on in verse 17 that the kingdoms rise out of the earth. Can you see that? These four great beasts that he said came out of the sea are four kingdoms that shall arise out of the earth. Um, What Daniel is saying is this, that it is mankind itself that has spawned these monsters who have risen to tyrannize the people of God. It is from a demonized humanity, a guilt-laden humanity, a sinful and a wicked humanity that these tyrants rise to torment the church of the living God. But the church's hope, you see, is that they come from the earth. They are only dust. Hitler was dust Napoleon was dust and the Antichrist when he comes will be dust they come from the earth and that's why Christians ultimately should not be afraid 
the tyrants are mortal men and uh, the people who have made fair bid to be tyrants of this century the Nazis and the Marxists of our own day Russia into Afghanistan now where next? of course they want the Indian Ocean you see they want harbours on the, on the southern oceans their harbours in the north and sometimes blocked by ice during the winter they're always pushing south wanting oil, wanting harbours the Marxists the Trotskyites, the Leninists all the rest of them that rise to afflict God's people dangerous as they are troublemakers as they are they are dust from the earth. John tells us in the book of Revelation that the number of the beast is 666 and then he goes on to say uh, rather cryptically it is a human number the number of a man. Mortal. And therefore not to be feared I wonder if you've ever noticed how many of the world's tyrants were little men. Napoleon was a wee manny. <laughs> That's why he had to go about looking so important, you know. Julius Caesar was a very slender little man. Hitler was quite small. Did you know that? Alexander the Great, it's one of his problems. He was a little man, conquered the world. And Napoleon, that wee dumpling, the wee Italian dumpling of the 1930s. Quite a tiny man. And I was interested to read that um, one of the psychiatrists examining the Nazi war criminals at the end of the war um, described them in, in this phrase... As, as far as I could see, they were just a collection of third-rate psychopaths. That's why they needed uniforms to conceal the fact that they were nothing. That's why they had to dress up with scrambled eggs all over their hats braid and gold and frogging and loud bands lots of noise to conceal the fact that ultimately they were of no importance we mustn't fear says Daniel they come from the dust second thing is this if you look at, um, at chapter 7 and verse 2 You'll notice that Daniel says that what he sees is the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. The winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. In other words, what he is seeing is eternity having an effect on time. The winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. Heaven stirring up this world, the world to come, breaking through into our world. And I'm pretty convinced that this vision that Daniel had was an answer to prayer. See, Daniel was a man of prayer. He was that before anything else. Before he was a great statesman or anything else, he was a man of prayer. And it's the teaching of the Bible that when a man comes to grips with God in prayer, the winds of heaven blow down and do something cataclysmic on earth. Um, I wonder if you're familiar with the 18th Psalm. I love it. Turn to it. I read this when I get depressed, which means I read it quite a lot. Psalm 18. Don't you get depressed? You see, here's a man with some problems. You'll find his problems in verses 4 and 5. <laughs> if you've got problems, here's the answer, part of it. Psalm 18, 
verses 4 and 5. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of perdition assailed me. The cords of hell entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. So what does he do? Well, he decides to say his prayers. Verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. That's the prayer. Did God hear him? He sure did. Look at the answer. (laughs) Then the earth reeled and rocked. The winds of heaven blowing on the great sea. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens, the winds of heaven blowing on the sea. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering around him. His canopy, thick clouds, dark with water. Thirteen, the Lord also thundered in the heavens. And the Most High uttered his voice. Hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows the flashes of lightning and scattered them he flashed forth lightnings and routed them then the channels of the sea were seen like the red sea opening up the foundations of the world were laid bare at thy rebuke O Lord at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils I love this he reached from on high he took me He drew me out of many waters. Verse 19. He brought me forth into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. And all that happened because a man said his prayers. He said his prayers and there were convulsions and earthquakes and the shaking of nations. Don't you think that should encourage you to pray more? It's the same message in Revelation. There isn't time to read it, but in chapters 5 and 6 of Revelation you see the saints at prayer And in one chapter, they're saying, Oh Lord, how long, how much longer is this going to go on? Much longer have we to put up with this. And you get the answer in the next chapter. And it's just like Psalm 18. Earthquakes, convulsions, mountains shaking. The winds of heaven blowing on the great sea. All because a man said his prayers. Don't you think that should encourage you to pray? Do you want to shake the world? Say your prayers. The third word of hope is really a word of hope in hopelessness. If you look at chapter 7 in closing, at verse 19 first of all, look what the little horn is going to do to the church. Uh, verses 19 to 21 I desire to know the truth concerning the fourth beast the Roman Empire which was different from all the rest exceeding terrible with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze very cruel the Roman Empire gave us law but they were very cruel they were primitive the Romans they were farmers you see not like the Greeks the the Romans were originally an agricultural crowd rough and ready very good at farming but they made an awful mess of empire in the end Caesars and all that. Teeth of iron and claws of bronze 
which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue of the empires with its feet. And concerning the ten horns that were on its head, the kingdoms inside the empire, and the other horn which came up and before which three of them fell, the horn which had eyes, intelligence, and a mouth that spoke great things. You can read about the Antichrist in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And that's what he does. Speaks great things. Mr. Big Mouth setting himself up as God in the church. And which seemed greater than its fellows. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. Christians are defeated until the ancient of days came. Judgment was given for the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints received the kingdom. Lastly, at verse 25, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law world empire. They shall be given into his hand. The church is to be given into his hand for a time, two times and half time. Did you know that the Bible teaches that there's a day coming when organized religion will vanish from the face of the earth? This place will become a museum or a garage, or a cinema, or a bingo hall, especially a bingo hall. Organized religion, mark that word, organized. Organized preaching, organized work of the gospel, will be done away with and silenced. These Things shall be. Of course, there will always be Christians. That's a different thing. There will always be an invisible church. There will always be believers. But there will not always be a church that you can see with your eyes. And the position of the Christian when Antichrist reigns will be the position of Daniel in Babylon, the position of John on the island of Patmos, marooned, alienated. It's happening already. Christians are alienated from their fellows. People don't think in Christian terms anymore. They don't think in terms of of Christian morality or the Ten Commandments or a spiritual understanding of life. Of course, they still send for ministers for funerals and weddings and all that sort of thing because they don't know what else to do. But Christians increasingly are alienated and estranged from the thought forms of worldlings, like Daniel in Babylon, like John in Patmos. Until the work of Christ is almost extinguished the teaching of the Bible and then one day one marvelous day a finger will come out of the clouds and tap Antichrist on the shoulder and say excuse me Paul says, when Jesus comes, he's going to blow the Antichrist away with the breath of his mouth, like a puff of wind. And when he comes, the sea will be stilled. This sea of guilt-laden men that has spawned horrors for Christians 
sea will be stilled. Christ will come, the beast will be judged, the Antichrist will be done away, and the kingdom will be given to the saints of the Most High. One great day they shall reign forever and ever. And at once I, John, was in the Spirit, and lo, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there appeared like jasper and carnelian, and round the throne was a rainbow that looked like an emerald. And before the throne there is, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. Frozen, silent, stilled. This sea that throws up things that torment you and afflict you and bring you into tribulation. When Christ comes, it's frozen forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. And may God add his blessing to the preaching of the word.